Chinese in general. <laughs> Welcome to our UCLA Extension Department of Business Management and Legal Programs video lecture series on entrepreneurship, new venture formation, and strategic business plan development. The video you are about to watch is an introduction to how to develop your corporate culture. I'm Harry Rudinger, your instructor. There is a total of over 40 videos in our lecture series that integrates with our UCLA Extension online course management program, Canvas. Each video strives to be brief and will have a bit of overlap with the other videos to tie our curriculum together. Okay, let's get started. So, our first slide asks the question, what is corporate culture? That might be a good final exam type question also. So it's a very simple answer. It's the shared values of an organization. The subject matter of corporate culture is often overlooked. It's very um, hidden, yet uh, but can have such a profound impact on the potential success of an organization. Whether an organization documents, establishes a corporate culture or not, a corporate culture exists. Whoever the focal manager is, or the CEO of the organization, or president of the corporation, uh, that person's behavior, that person's value structure becomes the corporate culture. So, we, so the leadership of the organization is studied very carefully by management and staff. And the, th the way they do things, the, their hobbies, their lifestyle, um, <clears throat> their preferences, little by little become an established corporate culture. So if you want to succeed in that organization, you better figure out what that corporate culture is. Um, if, if everyone in senior management roots for USC and you're an alum of UCLA, you might want to keep a low profile when it comes to football season, for example. Same thing with politics, same thing with religion. You have to be aware of what these values are. And often for the HR department, HR department sometimes looks for individuals who will be able to accept, get along, uh, blend in with this corporate culture, which is often unspoken, it's unidentified. And, and so when we can identify and build a very healthy corporate culture and, and, and have that out in the open, it's for the benefit of everyone. Everyone feels more like a team. They're connected. They have, they're, they're, they're people who share the same values. So they, they, when, when a problem needs to be solved, you know, everyone clicks and is on the same wavelength and, and works together. So our corporate culture also, in a way, is our brand. Uh, the values that we present to the marketplace. Our brand image is the values we, exp we, we express to the marketplace, whether it's a product or a service. Um, our brand image, and we've talked about that in our marketing section, but you know, we, have, uh, we look for emotional tie-in from our clientele. Let's always remember that people hire you first and what you're selling second. So it's very important that you and your staff, your managers, all are on the same corporate culture wavelength as well as then therefore brand image wavelength. So let's just bear in mind, and we're going to talk about this in a second in terms of different types of corporate culture, but our, how we present and project ourselves to the marketplace in essence is a projection of our corporate culture and then therefore a, pro a projection of our brand image. Really one and the same. So we're going to talk about um, how to develop a corporate, cultural, corporate culture strategy. And we're going to introduce to you the concept of there being four categories of corporate culture. Um, all a little bit different from each other, but to be aware of these four categories of corporate culture. So 
Corporate culture is one of the three, our corporate culture strategy is one of our three internal management strategies. We have um, a, a vision of success strategy where we use images to program staff and management of our <clears throat> um, uh, market opportunities, our corporate culture, um, our, our values, um, our strategy our goals. Um, we also have phases of competitive development. What are we going to do first, second, third to execute the mission statement to achieve the vision of success statement? Um, and then we have corporate culture. So these are the, the three strategies that make up our, our internal management strategy. We're going to drill down now into the subject matter of corporate culture strategy. And we have four categories of corporate culture. The first c category of corporate culture is a projection uh, and an identification of our company history and leadership values culture. So the history of the organization and how it came about, there's usually some kind of unique story relevant to the startup of an organization, how, how the mission statement was discovered, how the startup com uh, clients came about. And woven into that are often values that establish the organization's uh, uh, corporate culture from the standpoint of, we'll just say lifestyle, lifestyle. So if the CEO uh, is a um, an, an avid um, you know uh, health and fitness um, fanatic and doing marathons and things like that. Well, then therefore probably uh, uh, fitness is going to be a corporate culture. Let's say the CEO is into bass fly fishing or bass fishing. Again, um, that could become a, a part of the corporate culture. So we take a look at <clears throat> the combined values. Of, 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 of the leadership. Sometimes I, I refer to this as a, a, a stagecoach theory. So if we take all the senior managers, at, and let's say there's six of them and you got a stagecoach and there's a harness that has six horses on and they're all tied together. So the, the general consensus of the corporate culture is the mean average of all the values represented by the senior management that are leading the stagecoach, which is the company the staff, uh, et cetera. So we want to take, and this is where company history comes into play in terms of identifying unique instances that have taken place historically that become a part of the uh, culture of the organization. The next category here of corporate culture is um, our corporate communication uh, uh, culture. The, the values that we, um, and, and procedures that we follow, uh, and the ethics and the morals that we have when we communicate with each other. For example, I've been a Myers-Briggs type indicator team building workshop facilitator consultant for, for over two decades. And for organizations that embrace the Myers-Briggs type indicator, uh, one of the things that we really, you know, uh, uh, promote in our communication workshops is to respect the psychological type of others and look at, look at the differences that people have as gifts they bring to the organization. Um, so we don't, you know, so we don't complain about someone being introvert or extrovert or thinking or feeling, you know, we show respect. And so much of organizational leadership and communication starts by showing respect to each other. Uh, someone who's introvert prefers to receive information through text messages and emails. Someone who's extrovert would much rather have a cup of coffee or um, sit down at the conference table and have a face-to-face -face conversation about something. So being aware of communication styles and other people's psychological type is a part of how we might say would be a part of our uh, corporate communications culture. Um, the next category of corporate culture here is a, a corporate health and wellness culture. Now, th this is an emerging category of culture. Uh, corporate health and wellness is, is a category of organizational leadership that's been around less than a decade, less than 10 years, to be quite frankly honest with you. And it's, it's really exploding right now, given all the things that are going on with the Affordable Health Care Act and 
health insurance and, and the current health, health uh, status of, of um, the country. Um, you know, we as Americans are, statistically speaking, the sickest people in the world. We have the highest rates of heart disease, coronary disease, cancer, um, uh, diabetes, etc. And, and so it's been shown, and we'll talk about this more in a bit, but for every dollar invested into corporate health and wellness programs has a three dollar return on that within three to five years. And, and there's many other values uh, associated with um, uh, a corporate health and wellness culture. Know that the majority of people uh, receive their health care plans through their employer. And so it only makes sense that the, the healthier your staff are, uh, the better staff works with each other, the better they present themselves to clients, the better attitude they have, um, and as well as there is a lower rate of um, insurance claims and things of that sort from the standpoint of having a healthy staff. Uh, the next category of, of corporate culture is emotional intelligence corporate culture. And so, um, and again, this is a category of culture that's just emerged in the last, within the last 10 years. The culture, emotional intelligence in essence is, is how well we perceive ourselves, how well we project ourselves to others, <clears throat> how well we interact with others, how well do we make de uh, decisions that deal with the emotions of ourselves and the emotions of others, how well do we manage stress. Now, I said that from the standpoint of an individual practicing emotional intelligence. <clears throat> so the better we are at that, the, the more happier we are, the more likely we are to achieve success. From the standpoint of an entire organization practicing it, the, the key here is that a, an emotional intelligence based corporate culture empowers staff and management to give feedback to somebody if they do something that steps out of bounds of the uh, no, corporate culture norms uh, that, are, that the overall organization establishes for itself. In reality, the more that an individual as well as a group of people are aware of how do we as a group perceive ourselves, how do we as a group project ourselves to each other in the, in the marketplace, how do we as a group uh, interrelate to each other, how do we as a group present ourselves, uh, 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 interact with our clients and, and customers in the marketplace, how do we as a group solve problems and communicate in a problem solving process? How do we as a group um, uh, manage stress, uh, cope with change and, and things of this sort? The more we get these subject matters out in a group environment, team building environment, uh, it's like, you know, it's, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. But if we're always reviewing it, if we have um, vision of success type images of a healthy corporate culture, we tend to not have problems in the first place. And so that's a, like a panacea solution to a wide range of organizational leadership issues, quality control, um, conflict resolution. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. So the benefits of, of, of developing and practicing an emotional intelligence corporate culture are, are just absolutely amazing and we're going to touch more on that in just a bit. Um, so we're going to drill down a little even deeper now. We're going to go over these four categories of, of corporate culture and, and get a little more into the details. Um, so the the first of the uh, for the first of these um, cultures is our a, a culture that's a company history and leadership values. You know, so basically, is when we go to develop uh, our organizational leadership, uh, corporate culture, um, we'll get the senior leadership together as, and perhaps even introduce it to the whole organization. And you just, you know, we might just, you know, uh, put a survey around or have people write out and submit maybe with names and maybe anonymously. But what do you believe are the values that we all have in common? Um, you know, baseball, basketball, sports, health, just, you know, just start circulating. And you might then might have to have with senior management or a company, you know, uh, a team building workshop to say, we as a company, what do we as a company share as values? 
and, 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 and have the CEO or a facilitator lead a discussion uh, that asks that question and, and start putting things on a marking board and, and, at the, and, and, and then shortlist and vote and SWOT analysis, et cetera. But maybe at the end of this meeting, the, the management and staff can come over, come up with a list of what we as an organization, a group of people, sh uh, share as, uh, as organizational values. That's really neat when that can happen because it makes everybody feel like they're important and they count and that everyone's tied together. Um, now, and in some cases too, you know, the CEO might uh, when we look at the company history, or there might be pre-existing things that are just established that you know the CEO has, that uh, president, et cetera, uh, owner uh, that uh, that wants to say, I I want to build this organization around th these values because th these values are directly related to what differentiates us as an organization. So however it's come about, but getting those down in writing and, 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 and possibly even finding vision board images that project that are all pluses. When everyone's on the same uh, uh, wavelength in terms of the unique uh, uh, aspects that unite everybody, that's, that's all good. We're going to talk about uh, corporate communication culture now. I, I am uh, the fan of several books that deal with um, uh, healthy corporate communication. And I, I just want to touch on some of these because what I find many companies do is the CEO or key people in senior management uh, find a book that they just really resonate with and say, I, I want everyone to read this book and then we'll have some conversation on it. But um, these are uh, five books here that I suggest really, you know, hit the nail with the hammer, as they may say, really focus in on super healthy uh, corporate communication. The first one is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. When I write business plans for organizations and, and develop corporate cultures for organization, I always integrate these four agreements into the corporate culture. Basically says we're always going to tell the truth. Uh, everyone here is going to have an impeccable word. Uh, we're not going to take things personally. If someone's having a bad day and says something, that's that's their that's their problem. Um, I I focus on you know my melodrama, not other people's. I I receive information, but I don't let the words of other control my behavior and my emotions. So um, uh, so I don't take don't take things personally. No matter. You know, people have bad days, and so just be a, that's part of our corporate, 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 corporate culture is not to take things personally. Um, a real classic is, this, um, is um, uh, the seven habits of, I'm skipping one, I'll come back to it, the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey. Covey. That's just a, that is just a classic uh, a foundation for corporate culture communication values. Uh, they've done surveys of, of the leadership and management books that are on the bookshelf of CEOs, and that book is the most likely to show up on a CEO's bookshelf, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which deals with becoming independent and managing yourself. Then the next phase is uh, engaging the, the, the market around you, and the, the third category of <clears throat> these seven habits deal with keeping the saw sharp in, in terms of, of um, uh, living a healthy mental, uh, physical, and social life. I'm going to backtrack here. I've got business improvisation. And the reason why I put that up is, you know, we, we are not aware that we are more in control of the direction of, 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 of our communications than we realize. In business uh, improvisation, there's what we call the rules of improvisation to like never say anything negative, to always keep things open, to keep the dialogue going until we can find a healthy uh, way to come to agreement and, and, and sideline or, or agree and, and, and walk on. But, uh, but not to slam people, not to put people down. <laughs> And so we can state that the, and this is a key key point here, that the the rules of improvisation are 
actually the rules for healthy corporate communication. So any book on improv is gonna ha have basic rules. And by the way, um, uh, I lead communication workshops with improvisation where I'll say, Here, I'll have two people and have one person pretend they're a purple dinosaur uh, and the other person is um, a giraffe. And, uh, and the purple dinosaur has to start the uh, conversation by commenting on the giraffe's stripes. And so they have to play act and, 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 have, and come up with just you know, off the top of their head uh, a conversation for five minutes or three minutes. So it might seem scary at first, but before you know it, the creative mind kicks in and you start, you know, talking about, you know, your, 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 uh, your white, the stri your stripes look awful yellow today. I mean, and, and then the other person says, well, you have a very uh, uh, bright purple uh, uh, complexion to your skin today, Mr. Purple Dinosaur. So by doing this as, as an exercise, uh, just exercising the creative muscle, just like we, you know, we go running at the track and, and exercise our physical body, exercising our creative mind is, is a function also. And the, the better that we can, uh, you know, uh, if, so if someone says something negative, uh, no matter how much you disagree, you, you want to approach that and go, I agree, and, and then comment, and then it slowly but surely come back to the subject matter of disagreement and then finding a way to agree. So anyway, I'm just stating that the, the rules of improvisation are also the rules of healthy co uh, co uh, corporate communication and, and, they're, and, and making that a part of corporate culture that we're always engaging each other to uh, have positive, healthy uh, interactions is all a plus. I have up here too, and this has come up in many of the videos here, uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. And the reason why I put that up there from the standpoint of a book that symbolizes uh, a corporate culture communication is that I, I want to encourage the entire organization for always looking for ways to improve what we do. How can we make little changes that just have a, a huge impact in uh, our, our opportunities, market opportunities, our communication skills improvement, uh, but we're always looking at where can we make little changes that can make a big difference in, in the overall health of our organization. Last but not least, I have up here Rick Pitino's book, Success is a Choice. And, and the reason why I have that up there is that, that Practicing uh, whatever we do as an organization in terms of our corporate culture, um, our market development strategy, our competitive strategy, um, but we all want to be tacticianers in a certain way. Practicing what we do to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, just like if we make uh, uh, improvisation a part of our corporate culture, then we want to encourage staff to practice improvisation. Uh, you know, mix a little humor into our communication throughout the day. Um, but this book, The uh, Success of the Choice, goes over the, um, uh, the 10 steps of overachieving in business and life. And it's all good, positive stuff. And, and by encouraging these values in the organization, we're probably going to be a healthier organization, both psychologically, both socially, and physically, by having healthy communication. And I say physically because stress is hard on our, 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 our nervous system, our heart, blood pressure, and things like that. So the more we can be harmonious in what we do with the organization, it's going to improve everyone's physical health, mental health, and physical health. Um, oops. And then our, our next is um, our corporate, um, uh, oh, I think I got off on a slide. Okay, um, Okay. so next is our um, corporate health and wellness culture. And uh, our corporate health and wellness culture deals with, um, uh, deals with our physical health values. So if the CEO of an organization is, uh, uh, if, and if senior management of the organization are obese, overweight, 
uh, don't exercise. Well, that kind of establishes a corporate culture. And more and more, we're finding that if leadership uh, uh, embraces uh, a healthy lifestyle, uh, starts exercising, starts eating correctly, uh, starts um, uh, being more sensitive about their the biometrics of, of their body, their health report, their blood pressure, their um, their blood chemistry, etc. Uh, the more likely everyone else in the organization is going to follow. So, um, in ter to develop a, a healthy corporate culture, a health and wellness corporate culture, um, you know, we want to first develop a, a team effort around it. So we do this as a group and and start. You know, sometimes there's, um, you know, we can we, there's reward systems. We can uh, we can do things for the company to say that. We as an organization as a whole are setting a goal to, uh, uh, to lose a combined um, you know, 1,000 pounds of fat if we have 20 or 30 employees or whatever and divide it out or take a look at it. But you know, we, can, we can have contests, we can have incentive programs. Uh, usually uh, health pro uh, and wellness programs deal with health um, uh, assessments, records of the individual, uh, biometrics where everybody goes to the doctor and blood, blood pressure and that kind of stuff. And then uh, there's usually an appointment of a leadership team, uh, uh, that uh, a team that then comes in and takes a look at this within the organization and says, okay, what, what are the, the, the number one categories of, um, of uh, chronic disease type issues or, or poor health type issues, be it blood pressure, obesity, uh, blood chemistry, uh, hypertension, etc. And, and then the company as a whole develops uh, interventions to try to uh, bring this down to uh, a base, a base mark level where we're more in line with uh, a healthier uh, status of our overall organization. So that's a little bit of what it deals with, but it's got to become a part of the culture of the organization, or who cares? And so the more that uh, an organization has a health and wellness culture and policy, then uh, needless to say, we're going to save money in our, our health care cost. But a healthier staff is going to be uh, uh, not only a healthier staff physically, but a healthier staff mentally, a healthier staff socially. Uh, the healthier we are, the better we feel about ourselves. And, um, <clears throat> and the healthier we are, we have more of a, a positive uh, outlook on life and, 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 and what we do and how we do what we do. So it's a growing area of organizational culture that can't be overlooked and it's highly encouraged to start promoting it in all organizations. Um, I put that up there recently. I went through a, pro a process. I've, I've always been athletic and, 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 and strive to live a healthy lifestyle. But um, So I went through the process and became a certified corporate health and wellness specialist um, uh, through the uh, American Association of, um, of, health and, uh, of Corporate Health and Wellness. And um, and so there's my little accomplishment, and that's where I learned. And so it's one of my my future directions is to is doing more health and wellness consulting. Um, I put this graph up here just so you can see over time. So since 1999 uh, to 2014, um, we can see the, the rapid increase in insurance premiums and the percent by which employees now pay for those premiums. So employers no longer pay 100% of health care cost. They pay part, but then they, they are taking uh, these premiums out of paychecks. And so it just makes sense that the healthier an organization is and, and the less that an organization is paying for health care cost, uh, the more every Everybody says, and then the, the lines across the bottom here basically show um, how uh, uh, the rate of, of income uh, increasing relevant to the cost of health care um, is just the gap gets is just growing more and more and more. So health care is becoming a bigger part of of our uh, daily uh, uh, cost of living, if you will. I believe uh, health care is 20% of our total economy. 
Um, so we could, so uh, re relevant to a healthy culture, I put up here, you know, if, if there is a return on investment, ROI, for uh, health and wellness programs of three to one. So the ROI for a health, a corporate health and wellness program um, is three to one in three to five years. Uh, health risk reductions and <clears throat> health risk and healthcare cost savings. Uh, the value of investment, okay, the value of investment is um, improved employees' um, uh, morale and job satisfaction, um, increased in business performance and profitability. Um, and finally, the attraction and retention of talented employees because people are gravitated to work for a healthy organization and, and, and not so much for an organization that has poor health values. Last but not least, and I've been touching on this already, but that is our emotional intelligence corporate culture. And, and, um, and so, uh, uh, um, there are three categories of health when we look at it. There's uh, physical health, there's social health, and there's mental health. If any one of these go down, the whole show can go down. So we've gotta be aware uh, and keyed in that uh, our lifestyle is, uh, that leads to, and what we practice is uh, physical health, mental health, and social health. And when it comes to corporate culture, that has a lot to do with our social health. But um, the practice of emotional intelligence affects all three. For instance, if we have poor emotional intelligence, uh, we'll probably, uh, uh, let, me, let me rephrase this. We can say that 20% of health is exercise. 80% of health is what you put in your mouth. Who decides what you put in your mouth? You do. So therefore, um, we can also say that the majority, the reason, uh, uh, the types of food and how much food we eat is often, so we say perhaps 80% of the time, relevant to emo emotional eating, um, uh, comfort food. So the more we can control our emotions, the more we can control what we put in the health, our mouth in terms of food, alcohol, salt, sugar, fat, etc. So a healthier emotional intelligence is directly related to a healthier uh, physical body. Uh, a healthier emotional intelligence is also directly related to uh, a, a healthier a psychological state, mental state. So a lifelong commitment to the study and practice of emotional intelligence lifestyle is the best possible way to protect yourself from the effects and conditions of poor mental health. And poor mental health can basically be defined as falling out of the mainstream, having uh, practicing or behaving in a way that's not accepted or condoned by the mean average person in our society, and that's kind of a simple way of, of identifying poor mental health versus healthy uh, mental health. Um, I want to just review briefly um, what emotional intelligence is all about. And there's a, a circle diagram up here, which is uh, the EQI 2.0 Emotional Intelligence Instrument Model. And it basically says that uh, self-perception at the top, and how, you know, how well we perceive ourselves, do we accept our awards, um, um, uh, um, do we accept ourselves the way, way we are. Uh, and um, uh, self-regard, um, and do, do we have self-actualization in terms of being the best we can be? Um, and then aware of ourselves, where our, our emotions come from, et cetera. That leads to how we project ourselves, so self-expression. So if we have a positive self-perception, that leads to a healthy and positive self-expression. And so, uh, and that uh, self-expression deals with being, you know, uh, uh, aware of how people are going to respond to your behavior. Uh, it deals with being assertive and it deals with being independent. In other words, not looking for, you know, codependent type relationships. So again, self perception leads to self -pro 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 projection, emotional self expression. The next is what we call the interpersonal, the interpersonal uh, realm of, of, uh, of, um, 
emotional intelligence. And uh, this is, uh, deals with um, uh, you know, social responsibility, volunteering, you know, helping people out uh, where you don't necessarily get paid for. It uh, deals with empathy, um, and, um, <clears throat> and it deals with our ability to uh, enter into and uh, maintain healthy interpersonal relationships. So if we do that well, that leads to healthy decision making because the m better we can be connected to people, the more we feel in control and the more likely we are to make healthy decisions uh, that uh, are sensitive to the emotions of others as well as our own emotions. Uh, bottom line is we want to do things that uh, uh, help us achieve our objective what, uh, f to achieve success and happiness. And the more we're aware of this, the more we develop healthy relationships, the more likely we are to make decisions that's really in our best interest. Because if we're not practicing healthy emotional intelligence, we say and do things that make people want to run away from us. And the healthier we, we live our life from a, a healthy emotional intelligence, the more people want to gravitate towards us. So if you have poor emotional intelligence, people will block your cell phone number so you can't text them or call them. <laughs> Good example. Uh, and the healthier you are, the people are more likely to pick it up and go, hi, how are you? So, so we can you, we can measure health, uh, 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 healthy emotional intelligence by uh, how how uh, uh, the ex the extent of your social networks. The next category up here is stress uh, management final, and and that's you know that's how well we can be we can tolerate stress, how flexible we are, and uh, and 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 how well. Uh, and being optimistic, you know, uh, looking at something negative and say, okay, well, something good comes from ever, everything versus going, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we're all gonna we're all gonna fail now, oh, you know, versus a positive attitude and going, I'm sure we can work uh, with this uh, uh, situation and and see the good in it and actually capitalize on this somehow. So these are the five realms and 15 scales of emotional intelligence, and uh, there <clears throat> uh, and this is a breakdown on them. Um, so the the five realms: self perception realm, the self expression realm, interpersonal realm, decision making realm and the stress management realm. Uh, the 15 scales are emotional self-awareness, self-regard, self-actualization, uh, then emotional, self, uh, emotional expression, independence, assertiveness, um, <clears throat> in terms of the interpersonal realm, the uh, interpersonal relationships, empathy, social responsibility, uh, then reality testing, problem solving, impulse control, and finally flexibility, stress management, and optimism. The more you study and become aware of these scales, the more likely you are to ha act uh, responsible, uh, to make smart decisions relevant to these scales versus stupid decisions. One more little note here before we move on. Psychological type, like the Myers-Briggs type indicator and the strong inventory, deal with what we call innate personality. It does not change. It's like your fingerprint. It's for life. But emotional intelligence realms and scales are behavior, and we can change these. We can develop personal development programs. Um, and if we practice uh, uh, a healthier uh, application of one of these scales and realms for over 90 days, then it's, it becomes a part of our lifestyle. It becomes a part of who we are. So the beauty of this stuff is that we can change it. We can in increase our emotional intelligence score. And as that score goes up, the happier we are and the more likely we are to ch uh, achieve success. And if a whole organization is aware of this and practice, practicing this and self-policing each other to a certain degree, the more likely we as an organization are going to be more competitive in the market marketplace and achieving our uh, success goals. Um, the book uh, that uh, profiles this and that I encourage you to get a copy is uh, the, uh, the EQ Edge um, uh, by Stephen Steen uh, and Howard Brook. 
um, book. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it gives many examples on how to increase your emotional intelligence scales. Um, I have in here, just so you can do, if you want to do a self-assessment, as many of you are, are going to get uh, a PDF copy of the slides uh, in our class, um, but this uh, uh, is a uh, emotional intelligence scorecard, so you can self-score yourself here, just to get a kind of an idea of, of where it is. And so, you know, on a scale of one to ten, where are you in each of these scales? And then take the average for each re uh, each realm and an overall average, just to get a feel for what your score might be in terms of in the top 10 percent, etc. Um, this is what an EQI 2.0 emotional intelligence report looks like. Um, this is actually my report. And so you got you know bar charts, uh, a bar chart here that shows your strength of all these scales. Now you know I'm with a little uh, with a big smile, but I I I study this stuff. I practice it. I I put a lot of personal emphasis uh, in my lifestyle and how I interact with people to to be the best I can be from an emotional intelligence score. So I think my my total score is like you know a hundred and uh, hundred and thirty one or hundred and thirty two. The average is. 100. And when you bump, uh, uh, come across people that are very unhappy and you don't get along with them, their, their score could be like 70 something or 65. Um, 100 is, an, is the average. Um, and so uh, I encourage people to take the EQI 2.0 emotional intelligence instrument because this kind of let, this lets you know what areas of your behavior you start, should, should start working on. The, strong, the higher these scales are, the stronger you are in these scales, the more likely you are to be successful in starting a business or or whatever you do it's 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 really a panacea solution to a whole lot of organizational and, and personal um, problems uh, that just tend to start to fix when we you know our, themselves when we, when we practice this stuff so let's talk about how we can implement our corporate culture uh, emotional intelligence based corporate culture in the organization um, first is uh, you know, we we want to make sure that the mission statement uh, and a corporate culture statement is developed or we make a part of the mission statement to embrace corporate culture. So the organization's uh, values starts to, uh, aligns with um, uh, our corporate culture aligns with the mission of our organization. In other words, it's going to become a part of our brand image. Next is uh, that the organization takes uh, the Myers-Briggs type indicator and the reason why we have this here is the first step to mastering emotional intelligence is to, is to learn how to practice the opposite side of our four-letter psychological type. Uh, we can't change your type, but we can practice the opposite version of ourself. And the better we get at practicing the opposite version of ourself, the more likely we are to be um, ambidextrous or flexible uh, to maneuver ourselves through a wider range of situations. Next is uh, that the uh, we we train the organization on the EQI 2.0 emotional intelligence instrument, and then everyone takes it and is debriefed on uh, the emotional intelligence instrument, and then we take the scores of the entire organization and integrate that into a the common score, what the average is of everyone in the organization, and then we can start to take a look at um, what are the lowest scores there and, and what the organization as a whole can do to start increasing uh, the average of everyone's emotional intelligence score. And then in six months, measure it again and start to see this number go up. And as, this no, as these numbers go up individually and collectively as a group, um, we, we often see uh, major changes in the organization's performance in the marketplace. And then finally, um, once we've done th that from a number standpoint, we organize the organization into a workshop and, and uh, use emotional intelligence instrument as a team building 
tool so that we can have conversations with the everyone in terms of what do we believe is uh, the uh, uh, average acceptable behavior for each of the five realms and 15 scales. And so the end result is that the organization, staff and management and leadership all work in a workshop to come up and, and document these are our emotional intelligence uh, 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 goals uh, to achieve uh, these averages as an organization so, and then find ways with using imagery or write it up and everyone shares it. So if everyone's aware, then everyone can start practicing it in the workplace. Okay, so just a summary of what we've, we've talked about. We talked about uh, uh, the company history and leadership values as a corporate culture. We talked about corporate communications and, 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 and such as books and Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Don Miguel Reese's Four Agreements, Rick Bettino's Success is a Choice. It's just examples of, of uh, forms of uh, healthy uh, corporate culture and improvisation, rules of improvisation being the rules of corporate communication, etc. We talked about uh, having a health and wellness culture to reduce insurance premiums, to have a return on investment, uh, to have a, a, a return on value, to have a high, because healthier employers are, have a better attitude about work. Um, and then finally, we talked about emotional intelligence corporate culture and how we can establish emotional intelligence corporate culture to um, be a better team and to be healthy, more healthy physically, psychologically, and, and socially. And it's all about the intermeshing of, the, you know, as gears, all four of these, uh, these all four categories of, the, of, of these forms of corporate culture all interrelate to each other. So if we start improving one, the, the others get improved. And if we have a, a, an assertive effort to uh, define and work with and promote these corporate culture values in an organization, they're going to mesh together and we're just overall going to be happier, more competitive, and most likely more successful in the marketplace. So always know that our corporate culture is our brand. It's the image that we're presenting to the marketplace. The better we do it, uh, the, the healthier we're going to perceive, the more value we add to our services and our, our product. The more that people are going to want to be a part of uh, the organization, that they're going to have a, an emotional relationship with our goods, our services, our, 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 our team, our staff, our management, our leadership. Um, and last but not least, remember that uh, corporate culture, in a nutshell, are the values we share. And the more we define what these values are that we share and communicate that to the others, uh, the more uh, it's uh, uh, we, the easier it is to hire the best people. The the easier it is to lead the organization because there's less friction. Everyone is on the same wavelength of what we're trying to do. And to that note, um, that brings our talk on how to develop a corporate culture to a close. And we'll see you at our next video.